and welcome. Um, with attention focused once again in a probably a more in intense way on Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking, um, the Woodrow Wilson Center over the next several weeks will be hosting three or four sessions on various aspects of this problem. This is the first which will deal with economic development and conflict management and resolution. We'll be holding a second tomorrow, actually, um, on end games. It's, um, it's really a, a presentation of, of uh, American Task Force for Palestine, Hussein Ibish's uh, recent book on the one-state solution. And Rob Malley and I will be commenting on uh, one state, two state, where is this going? On October 5th, we will be having a very interesting discussion on the U.S., Hamas, and the Arab-Israeli uh, peace process. Elliot Abrams, Bob Pastor, and myself will be dealing with this very intriguing issue. And then finally, um, we are um, contemplating rescheduling a session that was originally scheduled for September 15th, which was to address the issue of Obama's Middle East policy, a scorecard, uh, Bill Burns, um, Afshin Malavi, um, uh, myself, and Steve Simon were going to basically deal with Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Arab-Israeli issue. So we're looking for a date to reschedule that, hopefully uh, sometime later in October, uh, on the first week um, in November. Um, today we thought it would be helpful, and I, I realize it's early, and this is the first of a gazillion panels that various institutes and institutions will hold over the next three, four weeks on uh, Arab-Israeli peacemaking as expectations um, continue to rise about what is possible and perhaps about what, what isn't possible. But we thought it might be good to gain some perspective and deal with something that is not ordinarily dealt with, uh, and that is the issue of economic development in conflict management and conf conflict resolution, not necessarily from the perspective of economists. Jane, Jane Nandy, who uh, is director of the Middle East Bureau at USAID, who deals with these issues, will talk uh, some about that. Uh, Shibley and I are not uh, Nobel laureate economists, and I, David McCuffsky isn't here, but I He's would I would comfortably speak for David and suggest he isn't either. But we, we, we want to deal with the economic and the political realities of how uh, trade facilitation, microfinancing, agricultural development, infrastructure, how all of this stuff fits into a larger, the larger perspective of Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. There may be uh, other conflicts uh, around the world um, uh, from which we can draw lessons, but since aid has been, since economic peace of this has been so um, important uh, to the American effort, we thought it might be a good, uh, a, a good place to, to begin. We have um, some very good presenters um, after opening remarks from Jane, um, who is director of the Middle East Office, the Middle East Bur Bureau of USAID. We will hear from uh, two veterans. Um, Shibli Telhami and David Makovsky uh, on this whole matter of where economic development fits um, and uh, I may then offer a few comments of my own at the end before we go to your questions um, and in an effort to generate discussion so uh, Jane may I can I turn it over to you good afternoon everybody I too can um take the distinction of not being an economist. Uh, but I'm very honored to be here today. Um, before I start, I just want to say that we gave a country overview of our West Bank program, which you'll find outside. And that may provide some more details that you want. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to join today for what promises to be a fascinating discussion on a very important topic. On behalf of USAID, I also want to thank the Wilson Center for presenting this event with us. President Obama and Secretary Clinton have been very clear that peace in the Middle East is a top national security and foreign policy priority for the administration. This was illustrated in the past year by the appointment of Senator George Mitchell, Mitchell as a special envoy for Middle East peace in the first days of the administration. Senator Mitchell is convinced that making a tangible difference 
in the daily lives of the Palestinians and Israelis is a critical component of the peace effort. Improving and building the Palestinian economy <clears throat> is central to this objective. Senator Mitchell's team works closely with U.S. government entities in the field to help and coordinate our various initiatives, all with an eye towards those goals. As Prime Minister Salam Fayyad noted, and I quote, a capable state is based on the foundation of a strong, sustainable, active, and efficient economy. By strengthening those economic foundations and helping the Palestinian Authority to build more capable and responsive government institutions, the U.S., through USAID programs and other efforts, is assisting the Palestinian Authority to become a more credible and effective partner for peace with Israel and its other neighbors. I currently serve as the Director of Middle East Affairs in the Middle East Bureau of USAID. But from 2008 to, or 2006 to 2008, I served as the Mission Director in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I mention this because what I bring today is that experience working in a post-conflict environment where economic development was carried out by the Bosnian people with assistance from USAID and other donors which played a central critical role in stabilization in that region. In Bosnia and throughout the Balkans, economic development has helped provide people with a stake in a peaceful future. Obviously, the nature of the conflict is very different in these cases, but I do believe that successful economic development in the West Bank and Gaza will build a climate for peace. I would even argue more so is needed here. As Senator Mitchell continues work on the political track, we need to double our on-the-ground efforts as we improve the daily lives of the Palestinians, ensuring that our work on economic and security assistance and institution building are coordinated with and support the political track. USAID's current plans, including the Economic Growth Program for both Gaza and the West Bank fits well into the context of the Arab-Israeli peace efforts. The development challenges facing the Palestinians are substantial. In particular, Palestinian society is a young one. Roughly 60% of uh, Palestinians are under the age of 24. Without economic growth, Palestinian society will be unable to generate the jobs necessary to employ this large and growing youth population. And as we have seen around the world, unemployed and disengaged youth combined with an active conflict are a recipe for continued violence. The U.S. government is showing its commitment to improving living conditions for Palestinians <coughs> through its financial support for development and humanitarian aid. In 2009, the U.S. government, through USAID, provided $776 million in funding for the West Bank and Gaza, a higher than usual amount to meet particularly acute needs. This funding includes direct budget support to the Palestinian Authority, continued humanitarian assistance in Gaza following the conflict there, robust infrastructure development, health and education programs, civil society development, and private sector development to enhance economic growth in the West Bank. Although our work in Gaza still addresses extensive humanitarian requirements, the situation in the West Bank is vastly different. In the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, the U.S., and other donors 
are capitalizing on many op opportunities for economic development. The Palestinian Authority has stated that economic development is a key for the future well-being of the Palestinian people. And the Government of Israel has recognized that economic growth and stability in the Palestinian Authority are essential to successful, peaceful negotiations. The goals for developing the Palestinian Authority are laid out in the 2008-2010 Palestinian Reform and Development Plan, which identifies development priorities, including institutional reform and sectoral development. These sectors include public and private infrastructure, private sector development, security sector assistance, and improved service delivery. The Palestinian Reform and Development Plan presents a private sector-led strategy for economic <coughs> growth and has recently been complemented by the release of Prime Minister Salam Fayyad's formal program for his government over the next two years. The U.S., through a range of agencies working with the Special Envoy, has coordinated with the Palestinian Authority to identify assistance activities that meet the Palestinian Authority's priority state building needs and that support the realization of a two-state solution through projects that lay the foundation for a peaceful and democratic Palestinian state. Using 2009 funds, we are building on successful ongoing programs focused on enhancing peace and security initiatives, improving the capacity to govern justly and democratically, spurring economic growth, investing in programs to improve the quality of life for the Palestinian people, and for pro providing for basic human needs. Private sector competitiveness activities serve to strengthen Palestinian economic growth create jobs and help the Palestinian Authority demonstrate the p potential of the Palestinian economy <coughs> to meet the essential needs of its population. Investments in the Palestinian education sector and a focus on workforce development for Palestinian youth will bolster, bolster support for the current government, mitigate poverty, and allow more moderate voices to be heard among Palestinian youth. More specifically, U.S. assistance will help stimu stimulate economic growth, improve trade, enhance government revenue, and establish the Palestinian Authority as a reliable provider of essential services. We are focusing on creating jobs by improving public infrastructure developing the agribusiness sector, and strengthening the financial sector through institutional capacity building to increase financial products and services needed to support economic development. The road to peace has been long, and the development needs are great. The United States is committed to working alongside the Palestinian people and the Palestinian Authority to advance economic development. This work reinforces the two-year state-building program put forth by Prime Minister Fayyad and President Abbas, which demonstrates their ser serious <coughs> commitment <coughs> to building a better future for their people. Moreover, our economic development work in the region is an important part of the overall U.S. commitment to Middle East peace and to the two-state solution. I would like to thank you for inviting me to open this discussion today, and I look forward to hearing the perspectives of our panelists, and I just want to mention again that we have a country overview outside that may provide a few more details about what I've just spoken to. If there are any questions left in your mind, um, contact me after the, the panel discussion, or you can also uh, send an email and we'll try to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Jane, thank you very much. Shibley?
Well, thanks so much. Uh, it's always a great pleasure for me to speak at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and uh, thanks, Aaron, for uh, uh, moderating uh, this panel. Um, I'd like to just make a few points, and, and I, I'm sure there will be a lot more uh, discussion in, in, in the question and answer session, but I'd like to make the points more about the role of economic aid and development and, and uh, what are the objectives and, and how can they be achieved. Um, first, I think we shouldn't forget about just the strictly humanitarian. We, 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 we connect it to politics and conflict resolution. It's important to make it. Sometimes it's a justification that is needed, uh, particularly in selling a program strategically. Uh, but particularly when you're talking about the Palestinian territories, the West Bank and Gaza, you have to look at um, the devastation over the past decade. Um, uh, I know that it is uh, fashionable now to quote the uh, the, the improvement over the past year, and there has been one, and it, it should be noted, and I think it's, uh, uh, there are a lot of efforts that went into it, and we could talk about that a little bit, but you have to also look at it in the perspective, what has happened to the West Bank and Gaza over the past decade? Um, how far behind they have fallen? I mean, if you look back uh, in the 1990s, um, you uh, looked at the West Bank and Gaza, and you said, if you compare those territories with the neighboring Arab states, Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon, um, uh, they compared favorably on almost every major indicator that had to, to do with health services, with education, with uh, a per capita income. Uh, and um, after the collapse of Camp David uh, and the second intifada in, in 2000, uh, there has been a, a marked deterioration uh, where on, on almost all these counts, the Palestinians have fallen behind, not only in terms of what they were, but also in relation to everybody else around them. And, um, and that is true um, certainly in the, in the case of per capita income, where <coughs> just in 2001 and 2002, 40 percent decline in per capita GDP in, in those areas, just in two years. Uh, um, <clears throat> World Bank figures in, 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 in 2002, 2003, 2004 had um, a majority of the Palestinians living uh, below poverty line, uh, which is $2, uh, $2 a day. So if you look at the devastation, uh, and this is before, of course, um, uh, uh, the events that uh, um, have led to the uh, uh, separation of Gaza from the West Bank and Hamas control of of Gaza, which has clearly exacerbated the dilemma in Gaza itself. Uh, but if you, if you look at it from that perspective, then uh, we've, you know, the modest 7 percent increase over the past year is very good, very important. But again, it's far lower than it needs to be, uh, far lower than it was, uh, still way behind uh, the region. This is separate even from the politics, which is looking at those specific indicators and the need for uh, humanitarian assistance, international development um, um, uh, is, is, is uh, big and, and it needs to be there just as an end in itself in, in the short term, regardless of the politics of it, uh, when you look at the, uh, at the conditions. So, so let's not forget the humanitarian dimension. I think we often do it. I think we forget it in the Gaza area because we, we link politics and economics and say, well, this is rewarding Hamas, this is doing this and that. Uh, but in the end, I think you have a population that is paying a heavy price and, and that is still underserviced even uh, in terms of emergency services. Uh, I think it, it, we need to not uh, uh, shy away from making a humanitarian objective a real objective in the aid. I, I don't think we need to create a political link every time that we, we talk about it. I think we, we, uh, uh, we mentioned $700 million. That's an impressive figure, and, and, but it needs to be higher than that as well if you look at it in terms of the, the needs and the investment in other areas in, in the region uh, uh, over the years. The second point I want to make is um, separate from, from aid as an end in itself and from uh, the humanitarian uh, aspect of it, in the Palestinian areas uh, themselves, there obviously needs to be a component of uh, institution building, economic institution buildings that would sustain an independent state uh, when, it, when it comes about. It's American policy uh, to support the establishment of a Palestinian state, a negotiated settlement that would lead to a Palestinian state in a relatively short order. And um, 
and you don't want to create a situation where uh, the state is not ready institutionally in terms of economic institutions, political institutions, separate from uh, the security institutions. So uh, in, if the timetable, if, if our aims are attained uh, to help negotiate a settlement that would lead to a two-state solution, uh, we need to be doing a lot of work to help uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, to prepare uh, the development of those institutions that could sustain a state, uh, uh, an independent Palestinian state. And obviously all of that has to be coordinated. Uh, it may not be the primary um, uh, task of the United States to pursue that, but clearly the U.S. has a very important role to play. The Palestinian Authority has undertaken some steps. Uh, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad himself has uh, begun a task of um, 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 uh, preparing a plan for implementing uh, a state, meaning building institutions that would sustain a state, economic institution as well as political institutions. Senator Mitchell's office is actually working very closely with him and the Palestinian Authority in coordinating uh, um, a, a number of economic uh, um, uh, projects, but that needs to be uh, uh, clearly accelerated, again, regardless of how it in the short term plays itself out into politics, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, institution building, economic institution buildings, and we know how devastated the economic institutions in the West Bank and Gaza have, have been over the years, and, uh, and how uh, complicated it is to develop those institutions without uh, direct uh, cooperating with the Israelis, who I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, who remain um, uh, central in the implementation of many of the, of the projects. Um, the third issue, I think, pertaining to economic, when we talk about economic development, um, uh, is, is one that was actually uh, 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 thought about in the 1990s, and I think it needs to be thought about even more now, which is not just specifically uh, what do we do about the West Bank and Gaza and economic development in those areas, but rather regional development. Uh, I mean, uh, clearly, uh, one of the things that came out of the Madrid process early uh, prior to the Camp David negotiations was this notion that you have to have uh, some economic incentive that would propel cooperation across boundaries and would generate excitement, would have uh, alternate uh, futures sort of dangled before people, uh, and, and to, to create a... Um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sense of cooperation among investors, uh, business people, uh, development people to, uh, to, to envision what the region might look like uh, if you have a political settlement and create uh, institutions that would collaborate across borders. And that was especially uh, central for the Israelis themselves who envisioned some economic, economic dividend out of a peace settlement that would envision them um, uh, increasing trade and cooperation with, uh, with Arab neighbors, even beyond Arab neighbors of the region broadly. And so uh, it's very important also to think about this component as we move forward in thinking politically about what, uh, uh, what American diplomacy is doing uh, to build in this economic component that, that is tied more uh, to uh, A, helping by creating constituents that might envision what things will look like, uh, but also creating institutions that might endure uh, once you have a political settlement. So those three, I think, to some extent, are clear. But the fourth issue, which I think is the one that most people think about, is the extent to which economic development either helps in conflict resolution uh, or prevents the emergence of violent conflict. And I have to say that on this issue, uh, the evidence is very mixed. Um, uh, it is obvious at the outset that um, economic development is not a substitute uh, for a political deal uh, or for uh, security requirements, uh, that this would not be a substitute. It certainly could, could help. Uh, it can sustain a process. It might buy patience. When you have a process that people can believe in, uh, if the economy is, uh, is, is moving forward, uh, it might buy you some more time uh, uh, to be with pe people to be patient with the process until it matures. Uh, but it's, it's improbable uh, that, uh, ec that economic development uh, would be a substitute for uh, 
uh, the political aspirations uh, that people have, uh, and it would be a substitute for political negotiation uh, and for security uh, arrangements. And in fact, I would even argue that in the end, I'm not sure that you can have uh, um, a very effective economic development uh, without uh, a parallel uh, political and security arrangements. Um, uh, economic institutions are highly dependent, as we've seen, uh, on the political and security arrangements. We've seen what happened, how much faith investors have lost uh, in, in, uh, you know, in the 1990s when people thought the conflict was really coming to an end uh, and um, were able to get people to invest uh, and uh, uh, think about uh, uh, the project Bethlehem 2000. You know, 2000 was supposed to be kind of the year, the end of the conflict, Bethlehem 2000 was a big tourism project uh, for the Palestinians. A lot of investors were brought in to invest in hotels and infrastructure and restaurants and, and tourism industry, and boom, uh, one day, you know, the whole thing collapses uh, and everything goes down the drain. It's very difficult uh, to envision that you're going to have a um, f even long-term investor faith on the scale that is needed uh, without robust political institutions and arrangements and robust security arrangements that would uh, lead to confidence. Uh, even operationally, uh, if you look at what happened in the Palestinian areas and where much of the growth has taken place in recent months, uh, Nablus is one example. Uh, Nablus is an example where uh, there is vibrant economy and, in, uh, and, and by the way, uh, a lot of that have, has to do with also uh, increasing trade with Israeli Arab citizens uh, who have come in to Gaza. And the same thing is being tried in Jenin, where you might have an infusion of uh, additional trade with uh, uh, more affluent uh, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel who had historically had a lot of trade with the West Bank but have had less of it. Uh, because of the, all of the, uh, the peri turbulent period of the past uh, months. And I'm not, of course, talking about Gaza at all for now. This is all about the West Bank. Gaza has is, is got its own uh, separate story. Uh, and if you look at what happened in terms of uh, what explains the economic vibrancy, um, sure, part of it has to do with an exceptional prime minister in the Palestinian areas. And, and don't underestimate that, by the way. Regardless of what you think of him politically, there is no question that he's been a very effective prime minister and very effective bureaucrat and, and has been uh, implementing things with a very weak hand uh, 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 in, in a manner that has been very helpful uh, to the Palestinian economy. But don't underestimate the extent to which what happened was a function of some relaxation on the security measures, whether it was the roadblocks uh, or this new traffic that came from Israeli Arabs. Uh, and, um, and, and that tells you one more thing, that much of what happens on the West Bank remains dependent on what Israel does for, you know, on, those, on those issues. And for now, they're relaxing. Uh, you can envision that they can close that again tomorrow. Uh, uh, you can imagine that you have one suicide bombing taking place, uh, and that's pretty much all it takes uh, to create this. Uh, uh, whether or not you have, uh, uh, you, you will have one, it obviously is not dependent only on what the Palestinian Authority does, but also on what Hamas or other groups might do. Uh, and they're not doing it, not because they don't have the capacity to do it, but because for now they've calculated it's not in their interest. Uh, but you can imagine that this could be renewed at any time. So the bottom line of this is that um, uh, economics matters a lot, and uh, although I don't think it matters in a way that we think about uh, in terms of engineering political outcomes. You might think that because the, the, the uh, West Bankers are, are happier economically, they may therefore be more supportive of the Palestinian Authority. The evidence of that has been mixed. Uh, in Gaza, it's true that some of the poll evidence shows that there are more Palestinians maybe blaming Hamas. But that's not necessarily outside. And even if they blame Hamas more, Hamas is still in control. That's not going to change the political reality of what we have. So it might have an impact on public opinion. Um, there, there is, by the way, in the polling, just as a, as a footnote, 
um, we, we uh, the, the literature, by the way, on on uh, development and and and, po and political attitudes, particularly on on issues of violence, is very mixed. There's some some uh, in one direction, some in the other. But on the polling that I have done, it is interesting that in uh, when I looked at attitudes toward the U.S. during the period of anger over the past decade toward the U.S. and I correlated. Um, uh, all the demographic variables that I had with attitudes toward the U.S. in the Arab world, outside the Palestinian areas, it's primarily in, in Arab countries, uh, uh, that the only variable that showed any statistically significant correlation uh, toward atti uh, attitudes toward the U.S. Uh, was income, actually. Uh, the higher the income, the slightly more favorable your views were of the U.S. There was actually a correlation between income and, and uh, uh, the, the extent to which you were angry with the U.S., although most people were angry with the U.S., rich and poor, but there was a, a, a variation across, uh, across these uh, 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 demographics. Uh, the other uh, um, relations to income that I just discovered, I, I've just uh, conducted uh, a, a my first uh, poll among uh, uh, Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, uh, I have not fully analyzed it. We will be uh, 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 releasing it at Brookings probably the first week in October after I fully analyze the results. But there is one thing that caught my eye on this as I was thinking about this panel. Um, uh, as you can imagine, the majority of Arab citizens of Israel do not favor uh, the notion of moving some of the villages and towns now in Israel into the West, in, into a Palestinian state if, if one is established. Um, and the question is why do majority of them uh, not want that? Then it's very complex. It has to do with identity, it has to do with history, it has to do with linkage. But in the poll, I specifically broke it down. And the remarkable thing is that a plurality, the largest number, uh, said it was economic opportunity. Uh, the, the the one you know the, the one third of the people who who said that they uh, did not prefer t to be incorporated into West Bank was economic opportunity. There's evidence economics matter. We don't quite know exactly how, uh, but that certainly uh, it, it it isn't the it is an indispensable essential element both for humanitarian. Uh, um, uh, 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 ends and for bolstering uh, political agreements and arrangements and ultimately security arrangements, but in and of itself, it never is and never will be a substitute uh, for a political and security solution. Thank you. Thank you. David? Thank you. Thanks, Aaron, and thank you very much for having me and to the Wilson Center. Uh, it's always an honor to be back here and to be a share panel with such distinguished people like Aaron and Shibley. Uh, none of us are economists, uh, but I would say, though, that I agree with virtually everything that Shibley said. Um, I think um, economic development is one of those areas which has engendered less uh, controversy I think if there was one issue maybe where, where I think the jury is still out is this question of does it have an impact on political outcomes. I think it's in the American DNA. Uh, as Americans, we just intuitively believe that if people have um, more hope, uh, economic hope, even the prospects of prosperity one time, that uh, this will somehow have an impact on political moderation. Um, and we'll have to see. Uh, but I do think what we're seeing are some early signs um, that the public on, on the Palestinian side is noticing uh, what is going on. Uh, the efforts of uh, with Salam Fayyad, who I certainly share Shibli's uh, views, is, is an exceptional uh, figure and uh, is a case of where uh, a person could really make a difference. Um, we're seeing in the latest uh, Khalil Shakaki poll in Ramallah, um, uh, Palestine survey research, that there's been a drop in public perception of corruption uh, because they believe that this leadership really cares about their economic well-being. Uh, to me, that's, a, that's an important indicator of, of faith in, in leadership. Uh, and I agree that um, 
that what it does is when there is this economic hope that it creates a political space for the leadership uh, and a sense of, I would say, political capital that, uh, that hasn't existed uh, often in the past, uh, certainly in the last several years, uh, because people need to somehow, if they could believe their own personal situation improves, maybe the very enterprise of peacemaking has a chance. And we saw this through much of this decade, that people lost faith in the very enterprise of, of peacemaking. So um, can we prove it's, it's linked to political outcomes? I don't know, but I do think we're seeing in the polling data that uh, support f uh, f for the Fayyad government is, is going up, support for Hamas and Gaza among Gazans is going down. Um, to me, look, here in, you know, told, uh, 10 minutes, I, Look, I agree with almost all these points, so I'd rather not repeat what, what's been said. I want to come out on a, maybe a, a provocative idea, which maybe will have some differences, I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll agree. Uh, I've spent over 25 hours uh, talking to Fayyad. I, when I add up over the last few years, I was, I was just in Ramallah, and I feel that his, especially his last speech about the idea of uh, what he called uh, state building in the next two years. And um, it seems to me, what's, what's really interesting to me is this, he seems to cr be creating uh, somewhat of a new paradigm of, of, of Palestinian nationalism. And I totally agree with Shibley and I suspect Aaron that you know, economics is not a substitute for political progress. There's no way. It won't be sustained. It's a supplement. But, it's, but it is important. What I think is different is the way, what it seemed to me, the way Yasser Arafat uh, defined, Palestinian, defined Palestinian nationalism in more revolutionary terms. Uh, physical defiance, armed resistance, um, some people, you know, when you read about them, I think the first Fatah office, I believe, was set up in Algeria in the early 60s. I think that wasn't a coincidence because that was the model that you kind of pushed the occupier out the way the Algerians did to the French. Uh, and I think that he defined that for the Palestinians for the last 40 years until his death. And what I'm wondering is uh, if Fayyad is, is, is doing something very profound here, not just in terms of actually building the institutions of a state, but getting them to, to link that with the nation building with the state um, itself uh, in a way that had not been done. I'll, I'll just start, I mean, there's a story that comes to mind. I remember after the f second Camp David, um, People thought that Yasser Arafat needed some better public relations. He, he, he did a, an interview with Christiane Amanpour, uh, was a journalist with CNN, and uh, she said at one point, I think she said, Mr. President, the people want to eat. What do you say to that? And he said, they don't care. They want the Terra Sancta, meaning, you know, the Holy Land. And then he, I think he took off his microphone and he just walked away. Um, I, I, I'm here to say that I don't, I'm not here, to, you know, the Fatah conference, you know, reserved the right for armed resistance, but I think what Fayyad is trying to do is to try to define nationalism in a way that to make state building something that is very much linked to the state, because the conventional view has been people under occupation can't really do this. Only after you have a state can you engage in these areas, and that has been, I think, the conventional wisdom. Uh, and I have some interesting quotes from Palestinian commentators on, on this Fayyad speech where he relates to this. But Fayyad did say um, um, that, that building th the institutions was central, um, you know, medically there was a central vehicle to achieving a statehood. He said we need to, quote, to gain the international community's respect and pass its unjust test of building the institutions under occupation. But he thought, like, we, we've got to do this to show also that we're capable. That's how I, I see it, and I think that's important. Uh, he said on September the 5th, just the other day in, in Salfit, building a Palestinian state doesn't need a permit from anyone. Uh, the government will continue to build the institutions and the infrastructure required for the state, such as schools, health, clinics, roads, electricity, and water uh, 
by the Palestinian hands. And I think he, you know, you could say, well, he's got to try to create momentum uh, for two years, uh, you know, till he knows the outcome of the peace process, and this is his way of doing that. I think he, he sees it even, uh, you know, beyond that. I was told that after George uh, Bush visited Israel on its 60th uh, birthday in May, uh, Fayyad said to him, he said, you know, these Israelis, they built this state, but they took 30 years from the Balfour Declaration to 1948, uh, you know, before they declared it. Now, I don't think he means that the Palestinians should wait 30 years, and I think it would be a terrible misreading to, uh, you know, to interpret it that way. But I do think um, he, he's saying is that this is not something that should follow statehood. This should, this should precede it. Um, Hassan al-Batal, the um, daily columnist for Al-Ayam, wrote on August 27th, Fayyad's plan deals with what our people need to do to establish their state. It is not a plan for establishing the state, but the state, any state, is based on building an infrastructure first. The state is an administration before transforming into sovereignty. And uh, a Professor at Bir Zaid, Abdul Nasser Najjar, just said in Al-Ayam, the government succeeded in bringing law and order and revived the Palestinian economy. These tasks were, were seen impossible before, but Fayyad's government was able to accomplish them. Those who criticize the government nation-building plan, saying it's impossible to do that under occupation, want to return back to the time of security and economy anarchy. Um, I think Salam knows the constraints, and I, you know, I agree with what Shibli said, that Israel has a key role to play, and if Israel eased things up, that also made a difference. It reduced the number of check posts, uh, I don't know, from 45 to 12. Um, I think Tony Blair gave Israel some credit. But it's also the security infrastructure. Now, General Dayton gets credit, but I think here, too, Fayyad deserves more credit because he has built a direct relationship uh, with his commanders. Uh, the raids on Hamas were not done by the Dayton forces at all, uh, but by his own people uh, and led by Fayyad. So it's not uh, Dayton's army, or as, as Hamas calls it, but it's the Palestinians themselves. And uh, but I think the Dayton forces have been helpful. Um, and, but I don't know if they've been as decisive as having such an exceptional prime minister. So to build the state, you obviously need the key institutions. I mentioned the security environment. There's law enforcement. There's transparency. There's a lot of these issues. But again, I want to just emphasize, so I'm not misinterpreted here, I don't think the economy alone, I don't believe in economic peace, as some have termed it, that will, is what will end this conflict. But I think um, you need political progress. But if people can see with their own eyes, not speeches at a peace conference, not more declarations, communiques, but they actually see their lives getting better, they could believe their leadership that they're not in this for themselves, they're in this to build uh, a Palestine. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that in, in that context that uh, economics could play a key role. Uh, I could rattle off some of these improvements that we've seen in the West Bank. Um, Shibley's done some of that. I could add more if you like, but I don't think that's the point for me. It, to me, is to say, is, is Fayyad trying to do something new? Again, it doesn't mean that the armed idea has, is passé here forever. As the Fatah conference said, it reserves the right to do so. But I do think that he is redef he's redefining Palestinian nationalism in, in a profound way, but with a real clear, definite objective of actually uh, building uh, the state of Palestine. Thank you. Um. David, thank you. Let me add a few points and then we'll quickly, within two or three minutes, go to your questions and discussion. I, I take a somewhat, uh, I mean, I agree by and large with, with uh, Jane Shibley and, and, and David. I take a somewhat more sober approach on, on a couple of issues. Uh, the fact that we, we, the United States, has programmed over $2 billion in aid since 1993 suggests that Americans, and I think David's right, find economic assistance a compelling handmaiden to political change. And it's, it is in the nature of our political DNA to expand economic horizons, even, if, even as we've expanded our own. 
and helped those much less fortunate than we um, in the wake of the Second World War do the same. So this is a, a very American idea. I think it's migrated to a certain extent to the Israelis who um, some with um, uh, more legitimate intentions than others, some do believe that it is essentially a component of, of peacemaking. Some would argue that it that economics should be the driver. Um, and it's taken a while. I think Salam Fayyad has actually legitimized this concept to a degree among Palestinians and even in the Arab world that it has, uh, it has accorded a degree of legitima legitimacy that it has never had. I remember in 1995 at Blair House, uh, Amr Musa uh, and Shimon Peres literally almost getting into a food fight with one another uh, because uh, Peres had proposed as he want, as is his want, um, the economic transformation. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a chicken in every pot, it was a computer in every home. And Amr Musa, of course, was resisting this idea. The notion that Israeli technology and economic change alone could solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is something that is still not um, shared widely. But I, th I do believe that you're right there, that Fayyad has given it a certain degree of legitimacy. Just several cautionary notes. Number one, there is no precedent in modern history, I do not believe, and I would glad to be corrected, of a, of a national movement negotiating, negotiating its way out of occupation and at the same time creating and building institutions um, while the occupation and the anomalous relationship between Israelis and Palestinians still exist. That is a Herculean challenge to the more rational, program, programmatic approach that Americans have taken toward building institutions and toward economic development. That's an, ex an exceedingly important point, I think. To complicate it even further, you are not dealing with a coherent Palestinian national movement. You're dealing with, uh, to this day, a exceedingly dysfunctional Palestinian national movement who five, six decades after its emergence has still not agreed with any degree of consensus on an approach to realize Palestinian national aspirations. When we talk about the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, that's not the way Hamas sees it. Hamas sees two Palestinian aspirants to claim legitimacy to lead the Palestinian people. So what should have been laid to rest years ago, certainly Madrid was the beginning, Oslo continued the process, that the PLO, the manifestation of secular Palestinian nationalism, would be the, not sole, but the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. That debate now, sadly, has been reopened. And that complicates in the extreme, again, the rationality and programmatic American notion, and even Israeli notion, of how to dispense and administer aid. Three, this is not, and I chuckle when I think about this, this is not the European Recovery Program or the Marshall Plan. I can't tell you how many times during the 90s we would receive from well-intentioned Europeans and Americans and Israelis Marshall Plans, literally, with the term Marshall Plan. This is not the Marshall Plan. It's not the Marshall Plan not because of its uh, size and proportion. It's not the Marshall Plan because European recovery had a relatively conducive environment in order to take hold. This region, despite its stability, increasing stability in the West Bank, um, is still a free fire zone, both politically and from a security point of view. So the normal patterns that would encourage economic development, trade facilitation, microfinancing, a regularity and predictability, which is what an economy is. What is an economy? It's the movement of people and goods on a regular and predictable basis. If you cannot move people and goods on a regular basis, how do you attract investment? How do you create institutions? This is a huge problem when we talk about economic change as a driver. And, and then, of course, there is the Israeli factor. And Israel certainly has uh, cooperative instincts because the notion of giving Palestinians a stake in economic development, dealing with um, broadening their economic horizons, alleviating poverty and despair, unemployment and under underemployment, 
All of these things are in Israel's interest, but so is, as long as Israel maintains itself as an occupying power, the mechanisms of control, which must, for an occupying power, contradict the more rational, programmatic elements of administration of aid. Finally, while I understand the power and the logic of um, Palestinian state building, and I do not believe that when Salam Fayyad talks about his program, he intends, as Arafat did in 1999, to threaten unilateralism. I don't think that's what's going on at all. But the creation of a Palestinian state, in addition to the political issues that ultimately have to be resolved, Jerusalem borders, security, and refugees, um, must be a demonstration of strength, not weakness. And that is it seems to me would, would be absolutely key in Palestinian calculations. So to borrow the line from Field of Dreams and Kevin Costner, the notion that you can build it and they will come is one that is still, it seems to me, a highly arguable proposition. And final point, as we approach the resumption of negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians this month, next month, whenever, the notion of how to proceed toward an end game is going to be the most significant and most important issue that this administration confronts. Not confidence building measures from the Arabs with respect to normalization, not an agreement with the Israelis to constrain or impose a moratorium on settlement activity. These are not the main issues and could never induce the Israelis and the Palestinians to actually be more flexible on the issues that, ne that need to be resolved. And that therein lies the real dilemma and the challenge for the administration. So with that, let's, we have a full 30 minutes for comments, discussion, and questions. Joe. Yeah, I, I, just, uh, I got to meet uh, Prime Minister Fayyad in Aspen this past summer. And he, you know, he stressed economic development as, as a real key. Uh, there's an election coming up, and there's some question of where he stood in the scheme of things politically. Uh, whether he, I assume he's running, uh, and if so, where does he stand? Uh, does, does he have a core uh, following? Uh, I don't know. Who, uh, well, first of all, in the elections, um, I mean, they're, they're, uh, theoretically, there are elections in January, um, uh, both for um, the Palestinian uh, Legislative Council, as well as for the presidency. As you know, in, in theory, the, president, uh, the presidential election should have been held last January, and, and there's a question about this period. Um, uh, and whether or not they will be held is, is not clear. Uh, Salam Fayyad uh, believes that elections are important, that his policy is actually to push for elections no matter what happens, that this is his policy. Um, whether or not Hamas will agree to it, uh, uh, I, I don't see it. Hamas's position has been uh, that they will not accept elections until there's an agreement on reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, you know that's undergoing, uh, ongoing in Cairo. Uh, they have th these negotiations have been uh, made some progress, but they really haven't. Uh, they're not near a conclusion. And Hamas's position is very clear, which is they well, they will not accept um, elections if there is no agreement with uh, with the Palestinian Authority. And one way or the other, it's going to be complicated because um, if they reach an agreement and then part of a national unity government that prepares for the election, they're going to be working against each other in the meanwhile. So that's going to be a problem. If the, if there is no agreement, the, uh, it's it's highly it's improbable that the that uh, Fatah will only uh, hold the election in the West Bank um, for a variety of reasons uh, because uh, I mean if you look at it I mean in in some ways the hope is that uh, Hamas would do worse in Gaza but the evidence over the past year has been uh, showing that on the West Bank um, it's it's unclear uh, now it's it's better for for the Palestinian Authority but it hasn't always been in the past year so uh, so I'm not sure how this would turn out. Um, uh, uh, the the point that uh, uh, Salam Fayyad makes, which is compelling, is, is this: that um, um, he believes that uh, this should be settled in an election one way or the other, even if he loses. 
even the, even if Palestinian Authority loses, that this is that now there is a stalemate that cannot be resolved except through uh, a, an expression of the will of the people. And um, so I'm not sure. You know, I don't know whether there w there will be elections. Uh, and I'm not sure that if there were elections, that we're going to have a resolution to the current stalemate in the Palestinian. Uh, public. I mean, anybody who thinks they can anticipate or engineer an outcome of an election hasn't dealt with politics uh, for long um, in any country. And I, don't, I do not know how this would turn out. I have no, even though I follow this so closely and I follow public opinion polls, I, I, I look at it in historical perspective and I say if the elections are held even tomorrow, I can't tell how it would turn out, let alone if they were to be held in January. I don't know how they would turn out. The point that Shibley raises, which has nothing to do with economic development, is, is really a critical point because it gets to the whole question of legitimacy. How do you create a legitimate leader capable of taking the decisions required to move toward uh, an agreement with the Israelis? A legitimacy comes through moral authority and participating in the struggle. Legitimacy comes through elections. And also legitimacy comes through deliverance, deliverables. And the real question, it seems to me, is whether you have elections or not. I think you're 100% right. The question becomes, what in the end will be the Palestinian strategy toward dealing with the Israelis? And who, on the Palestinian side, is going to emerge with the kind of legitimacy required to make the decisions and the concessions, same problem for the Israelis, to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I would just add there, um, when I was over there, every, if there was one consensus I found among Palestinians that I met was they did not want just West Bank elections. They felt they would be somehow diminished by that and, and, and were against it. They also, almost everyone now, you could say it's self-serving, it's convenient for them to say this, but they all felt that Hamas didn't want elections because they were not doing well in the polls in Gaza. So when you add those two things together, it, it, it makes it unlikely. Aaron's point is important about the legitimacy issue, and it will be interesting if Abbas feels, because he held this Fatah Congress in, in August in Bethlehem, I think for the first time since the late 80s, that he will see that his like uh, legitimacy uh, quote, quota or somehow has been kind of uh, filled up. Uh, it will be interesting how the people think about that. But uh, in these polls of Shikaki, you'd say that people think there should be elections, yet but they're very skeptical that they're going to be held. Mark? Uh, gentlemen, good to see you. I have a question about the politics of the economic I, uh, development. Microphone. I have a question about the, uh, econo the politics of the economic development issue. When uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu discussed his vision of a Palestinian state before he got into contretemps with uh, President Obama over settlements, he kept focusing on the issue of an economic, uh, economic independence. Uh, at the same time, there's been a rush on the part of the United States to try to promote economic development in, the, in what I would call almost a cash against clunkers program in the Middle East, which is we're going to give you cash and show you what a clunky type of economy Hamas is running in the West Bank, in in the um, in Gaza as a way of con inducing support for a Palestinian state with the Palestinian Authority. So, in effect, you've got the Israeli Prime Minister talking about focusing on economic development as a perhaps his way of substituting for political progress, and a United States administration that's focusing on trying to showcase economic development in order to induce. Uh, Palestinians to support a secular Palestinian authority against Hamas. And I'm wondering how you reconcile your respective views on it against what's going on on the ground. Well, I, I think that um, there's no question that some people do think that um, uh, Palestinian public opinion uh, would turn pro-authority and anti-Hamas if they contrasted the devastation of Hamas with uh, uh, what what may become more uh, development in, in the in the West Bank, um, uh, and I think at, at the, up to a point, as I said, there's some poll results that might support that. Uh, I don't think it works that way in general, um, uh, and I think that uh, we we have to look at it in terms we we, we evaluate things in such a static and short term. Uh, uh, environment that um, we sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, 
if we have uh, fighting between Israel and Hamas tomorrow, everything changes completely. Tomorrow morning, if we have a, a, a significant fighting between Hamas and, and Israel, uh, forget about all these uh, all these other things that we said. This is support for this and that. Uh, it changes all the sympathies, the 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 alliances, the notions, and that could happen any day of the week uh, without these institutions. You could you have to ask yourself, why would Hamas acquiesce in its own demise? I mean, if it were if it, it felt that there is a strategy here just to to sort of uh, write them off down the road, why, why would they cooperate? Uh, why would they acquiesce in the current ceasefire? Um, I mean, there are many reasons why they're acquiescing in the current ceasefire. I mean, it goes against their grain. Uh, um, uh, and you could say, well, part of it was the Gaza war, which had an impact. No doubt that was part of it. And, and I think the public is not ready for paying another price like that. Uh, but there's more to it than that. I, I think that as an organization, they, they believe that there is a place for them and that they think that at some point they're going to be incorporated into, this, into the process. Uh, they still think that some, you know, at some point they're going to be engaged uh, or at some point they're going to gain the upper hand. Uh, and, and that's one reason why, and, and for that, they think that if they should start violence now, they would lose the prospects and, and, and all of what they built. And, and in part, it's built on their read of the Obama administration and what the Obama administration is trying to do or, or is doing. Uh, uh, but if they were to reach a point uh, where they lost hope in that and things are going against them, just like what happened in, uh, when they actually uh, you know, took over in Gaza, when, when they thought that there was maybe you know, things were working against them, they didn't want to get to a point where they lose the upper hand. They, they move quickly to, uh, uh, to control it. Uh, they, can, they, can, they can do something akin to that. So we have to keep in mind that these, are, these notions that somehow we can engineer a transformation of the Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis the negotiation just by contrasting Gaza with the West Bank, I think, uh, is, is, is not really uh, realistic. Uh, I don't say it's not an element, but I just don't think it's realistic. I would just, a couple points, I mean, this analogy sometimes is used as kind of West Berlin, East Berlin, uh, uh, two politically and geographically distinct uh, entities among the same people. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Like I said, the, the jury's out if it will, and the incomes, uh, if it will uh, engineer outcomes. But we do see the drop in support for Hamas. I mean, I see the flip side of what Shibley sees, that the war, I would definitely agree with Shibley, that the war definitely among Gazans created a sympathy uh, among the Gazan people for Hamas, although when they asked Gazans who won the war, uh, very few Gazans said Hamas won the war. Maybe if you watched Al Jazeera, you thought that Hamas won the war, but not the Gazan people. But clearly there was a spike up, but what we saw is after a a couple months of quiet, it, it's reverted back to the mean, which was that Hamas uh, was, was pretty low in the polls. I think with Netanyahu, I just want to say a word on that. He gave a speech that got very little attention. I tend to always look at this one speech. It might be boring here, but I tend to find it interesting. Uh, there's a speech that Israeli prime ministers give every year uh, to a, something called the National Defense College in Israel. And it's, and it's a forum that is the antithesis of sound bites. And uh, it was the one form where Rabin basically kind of telegraphed the, the road to Oslo in 1993. And at this forum this summer, Netanyahu, um, I'm very hesitant to make the comparison, uh, that he sounded like Rabin, but he came much closer than I've seen him. Uh, I think it's on the prime minister's uh, or, uh, office website. You can find it in English. And he spoke without notes. And he said, uh, you know, people know that, um, you know, that uh, I've, I'm very focused on radical Islam. But what they need to know is what is the onus on Israel? What does Israel have to do? And that is to help the non-radical uh, elements. And he identified that as the Palestinian Authority. How do we help them? How do... We as Israel make a difference in their lives. The onus, he said, is on us in many ways. And that is something Netanyahu of the 90s would never say. I, I covered him in the 90s.
Um, you know, one of his aides just said to me about the Fatah Congress that if it was the Bibi of the 90s, we would have pounced on what was said at the Fatah Congress and used that basically to discredit all Palestinians and lump them all together. Uh, we deliberately showed restraint, although that didn't get any media attention either, because uh, it's the story that did happen, so to speak, because what does, you know, but I find that sometimes what's news is what doesn't happen. The news isn't always what happens. And to me, um, you know, when I say BB 2.0, I, I don't mean to suggest that he has become the embodiment of Rabin, but I think there is something happening here. There's an evolution that is worth paying attention to um, that uh, I think is different than the 90s, not just playing to his base, trying to play much more to the Israeli center. That I think, uh, you know, when I met with him this time and, and some of his people, I, I see differences than I saw in the 90s. But to me, the fact that he said at the National Defense College, not just what are they doing, but what is Israel doing to help them, I think that, that, that is an interesting change. Again, I don't want to oversell this, but I think it's, it's worth, uh, you know, following uh, that. And, that. and that speech, I thought, you know, was not something that was written for him. It was a speech that he gave um, off the cuff, but I thought that, that he, he seemed very emphatic. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, Could you identify yourself? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, right now, in both West Bank and Gaza, there are thousands of people right now in, the, in both the West Bank and Gaza. There are thousands of people living in UN refugee camps. And by definition, a refugee is someone who is temporarily displaced until the situation returns to the way it was before they were displaced, basically the way it's supposed to be. And uh, their lives are basically on hold until that happens. Is peace, even, or economic development, even? possible with uh, such a large fraction of the population just waiting for things to go back to the way they were before 1948 rather than work on a new state? Well, well I know about peace, but I, I, I mean, there's no question the refugee problem is a huge issue, not only as a political issue in the final status uh, negotiations, but as a humanitarian issue. Uh, and it's a bigger issue, obviously, in Gaza than it is in the West Bank, because, uh, I mean, you talk about the West Bank. Uh, in Gaza, you know, the it, the the people who are classified as refugees are the vast majority of the population because uh, Gaza was really nothing but a small village really in 48 and most of the people who came in were uh, well, for primarily from what is now central Israel uh, who, who moved, and southern Israel who moved to, to Gaza and they've been classified as refugees and in some ways um, you know it's, it's uh, in, in the um, uh, in the recent uh, uh, events that, that have led to the sanctions and, and, and the difficulty in catering to them by virtue of the sanctions because a lot of, as you know, a lot of NGOs find it hard to give aid to them because they don't, even if they can theoretically, they don't want to be in a legal breach and so there's a lot of self-censorship even in among those groups who want to provide aid. Uh, who are not providing aid uh, because because of that fear, uh, which has left the UNRWA, which is the one that has been catering to refugees, really doing most of the services, and that organization has not been uh, in the best relationship with our Congress, and, and even those in our own government who want to encourage it to provide aid because it's the only institution that is able to provide to them uh, in, in the short term, in, particularly in Gaza, um, are having a tough time. So there is a humanitarian issue uh, as well as a, a, a final settlement issue pertaining to refugees. Uh, I don't think that in and of itself is a barrier to uh, thinking about how you might resolve, want to resolve the, the, the uh, 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 how you might want to build economic institutions for the state. If I were to, if, if, uh, uh, if, if I'm advising uh, the Palestinian Authority on how to uh, proceed. I'm sure they have a lot of very good people who are lo doing uh, um, things like urban planning already and, and what kind of economic development would be needed, where the industrial parks would be located, uh, particularly if you have uh, you know, certain arrangements in, in the context of realistic uh, settlement with Israel. Um, most people think that the refugees will be permanently settled, uh, whether they will be permanently settled where they are exactly uh, or some other location, uh, I think the, the assumption uh, would be that it would be permanently settled. The bigger question would be uh, 
uh, uh, w w if you have an agreement for on on refugees that envisions the West Bank and Gaza absorbing a large number of refugees from places like Lebanon, um, you know, do we do we really have do we have a good handle on that? Uh, the people who thought about this already, uh, but there, we don't. We there isn't enough planning in the in these areas, and I think that has to go into uh, into the thinking, into the operational planning. Uh, uh, because the hope is that we're going to succeed in in the uh, in the diplomatic effort, and if you if you're hoping to succeed, you better be ready. Yes, um, in the back by the camera. Sorry. Mike Hager, Education for Employment Foundation. Um, it appears the panelists agree that economic development is not a substitute for political settlement. Uh, but I, I heard them uh, say that it does it is relevant it will support um, the political process I think if that's so I think the perhaps the next question is what kind of economic assistance can be most effective and I was impressed by what Jane said at the outset about the the aid program that there's a strong emphasis on education and job creation now, relating that to the issue that David mentioned about the, uh, the separation between Gaza and the West Bank, it seems to me that's a very relevant thing. I mean, to look, looking at a, a, a place with virtually no economic, economic activity, Gaza, and what this means in terms of unemployed youth, uh, it just seems to me that unless, unless that job itch situation can be addressed, you're going to have nothing but sustaining rage, uh, sustaining alienation, and an impossibility of having uh, individuals who can participate in any kind of political or certainly state building, nation building process. I'd, I'd appreciate views on that. I mean, I'd only offer the obvious comment that the prospects of significant uh, job assistance training or economic development in Gaza from the United States and frankly from much of the international community is driven not by economic rationality but by politics and I mean it, it, it's clear that without a solution to the problem of uh, the divided Palestinian polity one that is not tactical either one that really does put the Palestinian people in a position on an enduring basis to agree on a strategy economic political strategy it's almost unimaginable that Gaza will be able to improve much above the humanitarian assistance and more of which is needed I, I don't see because Hamas is increasing its control it controls a, a million and a half Palestinians who are incredibly important to the development of Palestinian nationalism as important as Jerusalem is it was in Gaza that the first Palestinian intifada was launched. It was in Gaza that Arafat, who still remains some, retains some sort of cachet as a Palestinian nationalist, uh, created a base. And I think that that issue has got to somehow be resolved. It is, if you ask me, what the single greatest obstacle was to a serious negotiation to address the four core issues that drive the Israeli-Palestinian conflict right now, it would be the problem of, of the divided Palestinian polity. With all the difficulties that accrue as a consequence of Israeli settlement activity, land confiscation, housing demolitions, all of that, the issues themselves, which are galactically complex, I do not see how you mend this broken Palestinian house. Because in the end, the testament of statehood, and Max Weber said it years ago, is a monopoly over the legitimate forces of violence within your society. How do you create a Palestinian polity that has that? It's going to require un unity. But how do you do that on what basis?
If I could just add on, on that last point, I mean, I agree with the broader point that probably nothing's going to change measurably. Yes, Fayad gives 80,000 salaries. Uh, more of his budget goes to Gazan salaries than anything else. He's got a, a bank program that he signed, MOUs, with 10 banks on reconstruction in Gaza. Will he get the credit for it? We don't know. But I think, you know, Aaron's point is correct that we got to put this all in very, you know, clear proportions. I, and I, I know Aaron was not saying this, so I, I certainly don't want to put words in his mouth on his last point, and I want to be very careful. I, I, while the divided polity is a huge issue, to me that doesn't necessarily lead to meaning bringing Hamas in the tent. Some people say they will be spoilers from the outside. I tend to think they will be spoilers from the inside uh, unless they have a change of their political program. I think there are things on the end game that can be done. It won't solve everything, but could move it forward a lot. I'm afraid to, to get, veer off the topic of this panel and don't want to take up too much time, but I'm glad to put forward those ideas on what can be done. But I think this question of where do you spoil most is, is a real question. If they could somehow unify under a more moderate program, that obviously is, is the ideal, and we'd be much better off than we are now. Yes. Benjamin to an independent analyst. Going back to David uh, Makovsky's point about a certain moderation in Netanyahu's uh, perspectives, uh, I tend to agree with you. And if you and I can see it, surely Hamas can see it. And uh, it seems to me that there's also a certain potential there for moderation on that part, some of which has already occurred. Uh, the bottom line is, what do you think of the possibility of Netanyahu accepting Hamas within a national unity government of some sort? I think without a modification of their political program as expressed by the three quartet conditions, I don't see it right now. There is a major gulf of perception here, um, and I don't know, Shibley uh, or Aaron alluded to this earlier. The Israelis tend to believe that the reason why Hamas is kind of quiescent now is because it's deterred militarily that it doesn't want to go through again what it went through, through in uh, December, January. I think there's something to it, but it's to a point. If there is no political process, I think their kind of ideological kind of default positions will, will reassert themselves. I always say, when I speak to Jewish audiences, they don't always like it when I say it, but I say, you know, the alternative to Abbas and Fayyad, it's not the Hadassah women of Brooklyn. I mean, it's, it's, it's Hamas. And if the political moderates don't have something to show uh, for their moderation, uh, these are the people who will pick up the pieces. So I tend to think that, uh, that the time should be utilized by moving rapidly on some of the end game that I think is achievable in this context. Not all of the issues, but some of them I do think is attainable, and it's crucial that the moderates are seen as being vindicated, that diplomacy works, that it's not just about missiles, rockets, and kidnapping uh, Israeli soldiers. So I would, I would hope that, that the time is utilized wisely. Uh, yes. I can speak without mic. Thank you. My name is Dmitry Novik, and I'd like to return to the basic theme of this uh, discussion. What's the role of economy to solve this conflict? And it seems to me that expression that economy is so important, it's not true. Because what is true, it's political decision and change paradigm of uh, negotiations. Because it's 60 years of negotiations with old paradigm. You'll talk until Messiah will come. And what is crucial is complete demilitarization of Palestinian authority. 
complete. No weapon with population. Uh, this lady said about Bosnia. It's a good example. Bosnia is going to be successful. And uh, someone said that uh, how you can uh, create new state uh, with occupation. We have two examples. Germany and Japan, they created new states through occupation. And uh, I need to say, I, I have a question, by the way. Yeah, you, you should ask and my, because we're, yeah, and we're my question is session. My question is economical. Do you, can someone tell me how much money injected in Palestine, West Bank and Gaza from the creation of Palestinian Authority. And what's the results? Shibu, you want to uh, reply briefly because we're approaching the end uh, of this? Yeah, I, I just want to say, I, I don't know about how much money was invested as such, but uh, I, I go back in that regard to uh, what Aaron said, which is, um, uh, remember that this is done uh, in the context not of a state, but rather of a an authority in 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 building. It wasn't even a built authority uh, uh, negotiating uh, the end of conflict with Israel and trying to uh, uh, mediate political and inst economic institutions uh, uh, in between. And there was a lot of uh, fighting and conflict that uh, has led to a lot of devastation. So. I don't think it's a really fair assessment in terms of how much was invested. Uh, certainly, it isn't. It's a lot less invested in in the Palestinian Authority than we invested in any single one of the wars that that we have waged. Um, so I don't think you know, in comparative terms, it's really a huge amount of money. It's it's it is a lot, uh, and and the Palestinian Authority is partly to blame for mis for mismanagement. But the the dilemma that Aaron mentioned early is really a dilemma that is that is a core dilemma that is very difficult to get out of. But I, I want to just uh, you know end with reflections on on the point that you made early. Uh, I don't I don't know the number, but um, uh, uh, I I just want to say in in terms of the general point um, that there's no question that uh, it, the, the economic development isn't going to be an answer to a political to this political conflict. I mean, nobody believes that. We we don't. I don't think anybody on this panel believes it. But this is not to say economics doesn't matter. Uh, it matters, as I said, in multiple ways. Uh, first, it matters for humanitarian reasons. I think many of the things that we're doing are essential. We need to do them. It doesn't matter even what the political consequences are. They need it. And what USAID is doing is extremely important on the ground for a variety of reasons. In, in what NGOs are doing uh, is, is extremely important in and of itself. The second, uh, again, in, in terms of um, what happens when you have a political uh, settlement? Uh, you want to bolster it. If you have, uh, 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 particularly in early uh, stages when the institutions are not uh, stable, you, you certainly want to have an economic environment that uh, works for you, not against you. And, and you need to do the preparation and the work to sustain the institution. And third, the regional cooperation mechanism of, of getting uh, people cooperating across boundaries uh, and incentives for, for people to play into, into the process. So I think the economics matter a lot, but there is also no question that they are not the primary means of resolving this conflict. One, one last point just to put it all in perspective, because it's true of Iraq and Afghanistan. The situations in Germany and Japan were fundamentally different than the ones that exist now. If, if you were asked the question, and I'll ask it to you, but this will be the final question. How many Americans were killed? We occupied Japan for seven years, 1945 to 1952. Do you know how many Americans were killed by Japanese in hostile actions on the Japanese mainland during the seven-year period? Do you know the answer to the question? I, I zero. Know. Zero. The answer is zero. None. Why? Right. Next and next there, and, there, and therein, therein lies the fundamental difference between Japan, Germany, and not just the West Bank and Gaza, but also Iraq and Afghanistan and American policy. Thank you all very much for yes, I mean, okay. for coming.